Right, okay. Um, now, I don't know if this travels culturally. This was a picture I took in Croatia, um, which is, of course, in Europe. And it's not just Croatians that do this. Um, I was going to say young couples. It probably is largely young couples. Um, <laughs> but maybe old couples do it as well. Um, I think that the padlock is sig signifying the lasting relationship or the aspiration or, or the pretense if you're cynical <laughs> so the aspiration it's a lasting relationship um, and I just like this one this was um, just walking along the road and then there was this fence and this was just a small part of the uh, sea of, of padlocks so this is this is social capital again perhaps bonding social capital that's what it meant to me again i wasn't psychic i i uh, didn't know that at the time that i would be talking about it but yeah so that's so the question is a simple policy question is should we be encouraging more of these now i don't mean should we subsidize the cost of padlocks but should we be trying to encourage more relationships or other things that might encourage um, the development and s sustaining of, of social capital. Do you do this in Taiwan? Um. I don't mean you personally. Does, do people do it in Taiwan? <laughs> Right. Kenya? No. no. But the other forms, like, uh -huh. if they have some beads of. Ah, yes. Okay. That's right. And it has become, I have noticed, people wearing, it's become more global, wearing sort of um, friendship bands or whatever they're called. And of course, I'm thinking more traditionally, and this is very unecological, people used to carve initials on trees and things like that. Well, you know, it's all social capital. It doesn't do the tree much good, but maybe it's good for health. Well, that's the question. Is it good for health? Okay, so lecture four. Um, I'm going to try and get implications for health policy and maybe for research. And I, I, I add the and research because I think the implications of health policy are not obvious, and that's probably because we need more research. But let's, let's see about that. So, should health policy care about social capital? Or not? I mean... We worry about how many doctors or nurses we've got available. We worry about p patients' access to health care. We worry about whether prices are too much of a barrier to ac accessing health care. Um, we worry, ab from a public health perspective, we worry about disease prevention and health promotion. We worry about clean water and sanitation. We worry about improving diets. Should we add to our worries and worry or be concerned about social capital? Should we be doing something or a series of things about social capital? Now, maybe we are already. I gave the example earlier today about social norms, and my example, which I felt was a very strong one with respect to social norms, was the changing attitude towards smoking in public. Okay, so that's, that's the th issue. Um, now, potentially, there may be important distributional implications. And we haven't touched on this yet, and I want to look at it now. For example, there may be a relationship between social capital and socioeconomic inequalities in health. Now, the sort of thing we're going to look at is... To what extent, if we have more social capital, 
is that going to improve access to health care, perhaps um, reduce inequalities in health? Or might it be that increasing social capital, like so many programmes that improve health or opportunities for health care, is going to increase inequality because the group that gets the greatest gain are those who are already advantaged? Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. I think it's quite reasonable to believe, so that's one reason you might be interested in, for health policy purposes, interested in social capital, the distribution aspect. I think the second one, and it's a fairly obvious one, is it's quite plausible that the effectiveness and possibly the cost effectiveness of different health policies may depend on the extent and nature of social capital. Some pol health policies may not be very effective if you don't have enough social capital, for example. So that's seeing social capital very much as an input, that along with all the hospitals and the health services and the healthcare personnel, you maybe also need social capital to get the greatest health benefits from those investments. Um, maybe mental health and social care are really good examples of this. Uh, where it's not just enough to look at the in inputs, traditional inputs to healthcare, such as doctors, nurses, uh, drugs, etc. You maybe have to look at other inputs to healthcare, in particular the social capital. Now, it might also be that policies which are aimed at increasing social capital or sustaining levels of social capital, they may be a cost-effective way of, of securing better health outcomes. Um, the example here, if we go back to it, smoking. Quite possibly um, changing the social norm regarding smoking in public is a much more cost-effective way to obtain improved health than supplying individual counselling to patient to smokers or nicotine patches to smokers or things like that. And so that's a possibility we need to bear in mind.